the national level conferences and workshops. Uh, during the before the uh, COVID uh, season era, we call it COVID era. We had to, we had a lot of uh, activities. Our uh, every month we used to have professional uh, meets. Yeah. During this lockdown yeah, period, along with the Kerala radiology education and support team, MMA meeting. Yeah. We are regularly conducting webinars on various imaging related topics. At the organizational level, Kochi chapter is one of the most vibrant chapters in India. All these are possible due to the support from all radiologists in Kochi and also due to the able guidances of our leaders, Dr. Rija Matthew, Dr. Amal Anthony and Damesh and I. Dr. Rija Matthew is the state secretary and he was awarded consecutively in 2019 and 2020 national conference as the best secretary of, in India. Also, <laughs> it's for a project called Samrekshan, which is to <laughs> Samrekshan, which is for saving the lives of pregnant ladies and the fetus. This project was accepted by Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and Jharkhand, and the government is integrating some traction into their health program. Dr. Amal Anthony is the immediate uh, past president of National Vice President, National Vice President of IRIA. He had done a lot of activities to improve the scientific uh, base of IRIA. You all know Dr. Amesh and I, he is the uh, Vice President of uh, Kuchchi IMA. And he has also been awarded as for his work in web related activities and his work in social media. And you all know he is also an active member or a very lead member in the Namude Adogi project. This is our strength. We are highly thankful to IMA for uh, all the support you have extended to us. I have the honor to say that we have successfully conducted many conferences in Kochi at IMA Hall. Uh, and we thank you, thank IMA for all the help you have rendered to us. And with this, we will start the scientific program with, I welcome Dr. Amal Anthony, MD, DNB, MNMS, Chief Consultant in uh, Lisi Hospital Radiology and Imaging Services. He has vast experience in CT, MRI, and other allied branches of radiology. He will be discussing with you on basics of CT. I invite Amal Anthony to take over the session. Thank you. Good evening to you all. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Is the screen visible? No. No. It is visible to me. Yes, screen is visible. Yes, yes. You are audible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fine. Now it's visible. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. So warm welcome to you all. Uh, let me thank IMA for giving this opportunity to IRA in particular. Because uh, we work, uh, IRA and IMA in Cochin, they work, we work together and we are always thankful to the support given by IMA. Now, today's uh, topic is uh, CT basics. Now, uh, we know that uh, CT itself could turn out to be a branch for doing uh, MD at the current level of uh, explosion of investigations which have taken place and the developments which have taken place. But uh, the learning objectives of today's session would be first we'll have an overview of the physics in relation to x-rays then overview of windows level and width the current status of ct machines the types of ct studies which we generally come across the risks involved in ct imaging general application application specific to chest and finally CT as an imaging tool in helping out guided interventions. And finally, just a comparison between CT and MRI. 
Now, physics in relation to X-rays is very simple. CT is just a sophisticated form of X-rays because where we have a static X-ray tube in routine radiographs, here we have the X-ray tube going around the patient and the patient being fed into the gantry. Now, the advantage of CT is CT is able to calculate the attenuation of X-ray at every single pixel or at every point. It is this mathematical calculation which differentiates CT from X-ray. So instead of just getting a radiograph, we are able to get slices. And these slices, the importance of these slices is we can perceive depth and at the same time, we can differentiate between various tissues. So it is this perception of depth and differentiation of various tissues, which is the key to understanding CT. Now, this is a radiograph, chest radiograph, and on this side, you just see the air containing lung and soft tissues and bone. But when you take a CT section, you can appreciate the mediastinal structures, the air containing lung, the bony thoracic cage, and the soft tissues. Similarly, this is an abdominal radiograph. Just appreciate the soft tissues and bone and vague outline of liver and spleen there. But when you take a CT, you can appreciate all the tissues which come across in that particular slice. Now, how we are able to differentiate between tissues, we have what is known as CT Hounsfield numbers, named after G.N. Hounsfield, who is credited with the invention of CT. Now, in CT numbers, we have zero, which is assigned to water, and two negative numbers for fat and air. So air comes up to minus 1,000, while bone comes to plus 1,000. And if you look at the soft tissues, they come at around 30 to 40, and calcifications will be somewhere under 12. So just based on this CT number, whenever we have doubt, we can differentiate between various tissues. Now that is just a pictorial representation. You can see a CT machine there. That is the gantry which contains the X-ray tube, which keeps rotating around the patient. And this is the CT table which, kept, which, which keeps feeding the patient into the gantry. And, and for comparison, you can see an X-ray machine. Now coming to just an overview of windows level and width. Now all tissues, that, that means from minus 1000 to plus 1000, that means 2000 CT numbers are there in every CT section. Obviously we cannot represent all these CT numbers with the present grayscale. So what do we do? We decide on which tissue we want to see. For example, if you want to look at the lung parenchyma, you should choose a negative CT number because we are looking at air, air is negative. So we select a negative CT number, so that is called the level. And the width we adjust accordingly. So accordingly we can have a lung window. Now look at this lung window here, we are seeing the details of lung. Now lung is on the negative side, so all the rest of the tissues are all higher than lung or higher density than lung, so all the tissues are whitened out. That means they are more dense as compared to lung. So we can just see the details of the lung parenchyma here, not even the media is made out. Now. On the contrary, you compare here, this is a soft tissue window. That means we are looking at soft tissues. Now, because tissues come intermediate density around 30 to 40, look at the lung, lung and fat. They are of negative window or negative density, so they become black. And you can see the bone is white because bone is denser than soft tissue. Now, here you can see, you can see a bone window where you are just looking at the details of the bone. The rest of the tissues, especially the Fat and air are black, and not only that, it is difficult for you to differentiate between fat and air. So these are the three common windows, depending on what you want to see. It's a lung window, soft tissue window, soft tissue window. Now, if you look at it, these days we all talk about multi-slice CT. It started off with a single slice, now we have gone up to 620 or even more. Now even we, we have flat panel. Now what is the idea behind this? The idea is to improve the coverage with each rotation of the X-ray tube. So as you have more and more slices, you can have more and more coverage. That means in a single breath hold, like there is a stage where in a single breath hold, you can cover the entire thorax and in true breath holds or just a breath hold, you can even cover the abdomen. So this is of great importance. One, the scan time is less, the radiation dose is less, and because the volume is acquired in a better fashion, you get better recons and it is this Better reconstruction can give us a lot of angiograms and uh, angiograms of all the vessels and also the reconstructions of bones and joints. Now, this is a pictorial representation of multi slice CT and how the patient is being fed into the X ray tube. Now, we can have different types of uh, CT studies. 
a non anand ct study which is routinely done say a plain brain for a head injury or a plain brain a plain lung study for routine indications or a plain ct kub to detect stone hydronephrosis and so on so that is a routine non enhanced ct study then we can have enhanced ct study where we give administration of iv iodinated contrast and then we can also give positive contrast like cerium or negative contrast like iodinated these are things we need to ct angiograms are the study of vessels now these days no business Uh, routine angiograms now angio routine angiograms are done with a view to to do any interventional procedure but otherwise normal angiograms have all been replaced by ct angiograms ct enterography where you want to see the details of uh, bowel loops after distending them with manitor ct cystonography where you inject contrast through a lumbar puncture and then see if there is csf leakage then we can have other soft tissue applications like ct virtual bronchoscopy where you can look through the bronchus you can look through the colon it's called colonoscopy mm -hmm. then you can even slice through the patient especially in a post mortem case even without using a knife with the help of ct you can do even virtual ct autopsies now what are the risks involved with ct obviously the the major concern is of course radiation because we know it is using x rays and the the dose of x rays a dose of x ray which is used as compared to radiographs is much much more so whenever you ask for a ct you have to have a clear idea about the appropriateness of the investigation you have asked for and there has to be a special caution in children in pregnant women and also in women in child bearing age group because we have to decide the appropriateness and we have to weigh the risk versus benefit as far as this investigation is concerned so for practical purposes as far as radiation dose is concerned you know the dexa scan which is used for bone mineral densitometry that has got the lowest radiation then comes dental x rays then comes chest x rays and mammos are much more than that then comes ct head ct chest ct abdomen and the maximum radiation comes from pet ct that is the radiation side now the other risk which is involved is whenever we give contrast remember we are giving an iodinated contrast there are two important issues with iodinated contrast one is it can have an anaphylactic re reaction the second is it is toxic to kidneys so it can have a contrast induced nephropathy now anaphylaxis is something which is not under our control obviously if the patient has got previous sensitivity uh, history we can take precautions by giving steroid and other medications and as far as contrast induced nephropathy is concerned the present recommendation is that we go for not creatinine we go for effective gfr and if the effective gfr is less than 30 contrast administration is contraindicated you have to think of an alternative imaging modality like ultrasound or mri or just a plain ct scan now this is a comparison of the different doses you can see dental x ray is much less than chest x ray now if chest x ray is taken as one unit now you can see that a pelvic ct scan is almost equivalent to 100 x rays so that is a sort of dose we are looking at and also we can uh, compare this with uh, the natural background radiation from a chest x ray it's around just 10 days of natural radiation background radiation now coming to applications in general we know that after chest x ray or after plain radiographs ct is the most common imaging modality these days and it has got a whole lot of applications head injury it still remains the investigation of choice for paranasal sinuses before any functional endoscopic sinus surgery paranasal sinus ct is a road map for ent surgeons for anything to do with chest it's again an imaging modality which is relied upon abdomen in general yes and vascular study as i said these days hardly anybody does conventional angiograms and fractures of complicated joints where surgeons are interested in the number of fragments intraarticular fragments and their spatial orientation and from all this the most important advantage of ct is it can depict hemorrhage wherever it is it can show calcification for sure and it can depict not only the normal air containing in contained in various structures but it can also show pathological air now some of the examples which we can see here this is a case of head injury you can see the contusions there and you can see the subdural hemorrhage this is a case of hypertensive bleed in 
left putamen. You can see this hemorrhage is leaked into the Amal, Amal, can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. Uh, anyone can pinch and enlarge the image on the screen. If you want to see the whole image, you can actually zoom on the on your own phone screen. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite helpful when you look at radiology. Thank you, Amal. Yeah, thank you. So that is a, a right putamen hematoma. That is, you can see this, this is bright, denser than the brain parenchyma. If you take a CT Hounsfield unit here, it will be around 60 to 70, which tells you that this, this is blood. Now you can see the blood has seeped into the ventricular system there. Now this is periventricular or sub calcification, characteristic of tuberous sclerosis. So calcification and hemorrhage are depicted well on CT. And I said about complicated fractures, you can see this pelvic fracture here. All the fragments are depicted very well in a three-dimensional view. Not only that, the spatial orientation is also very clear. Now coming to air, it's not only normal air which we are concerned about, like in emphysema, the spironephritis, we would like to see the air which is there only in the kidney or it is there in the perinephric space. Now this is a diabetic patient with extensive emphysema, the spironephritis, so much so, the kidney is not clearly visualized in this. Now, this is a case of CT cystonogram where you have injected contrast, lumbar puncture, and you can see the contrast containing CSF leaking through the cribriform plate. Now, routine applications, anything in abdomen, this is a suspected hepatoma or hepatocellular carcinoma. You can see the brightly enhancing lesion on arterial phase. You can see the contrast in iota there. So this is the arterial phase. You can see an enhancing lesion there. A large pancreatic tumor there, which is seen very well. And another case here, you can see this is a case of extensive renal cell carcinoma with invasion into renal vein. This is the prarenal tumor there. This is a bowel lesion there. You can see it on this view also. Now coming to CT angiogram. As I said, routine angiograms are out. Routine angiograms are done with a view to do a plasty with a view to do with a view to intervene in some way or the other. Otherwise, whether it's pulmonary circulation, aortic, whether it is congenital heart disease, coronary artery disease, massive hemoptysis, triple rule out where you want to rule out dissection, coronary artery disease, and pulmonary thromboembolism, workup of renal donors, or you want to confirm renal artery stenosis, which you have suspected a case of hematuria of unknown cause, any mesenteric thrombosis, GI bleed, or a peripheral arterial disease, all these conditions. That means wherever you are suspecting a vascular issue, including a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you can rely on CT angiogram to give you good study of vessels and after or sans bone. That means you can take out the bone from these images and you can get a subtracted image of vessels. Now, these are various depictions of that. So that is after a pulmonary angiogram, you can see the pulmonary artery is very clearly including its segmental and subsegmental branches. And this is a case of pulmonary thrombus. You can see the contrast enhanced main pulmonary artery and right, right and left pulmonary arteries. And you can see the unenhanced thrombus sitting within the vessel. It's not only this, you can trace it to the subsegmental level. Now, here you can see an aortic aneurysm which is seen in various 3D reconstructions. Peripheral angiograms, again, you can see a lower limb angiogram there. You can see the vessel narrowing and you can see an aneurysm of the external iliac artery there. Upper limb angiograms, this is a cerebral angiogram. You can see a echo aneurysm there. This is a cerebral venogram from the same image. You take delayed images, you can cast the veins there or the dural sinuses of the brain. You can see the cerebral venograms very clearly. Workup for transplant donors, you can depict the kidneys very well. You can depict the renal arteries and then in a delayed phase, you can also show the urogram. Now, this is suspected case of mesenteric thrombosis. That's the mesenteric artery there. You can see thrombus within the SMA. Coming to coronary arteries, especially CT coronary angiographies, this is not a replacement for a conventional CT coronary angiography, but in asymptomatic patients with risk for coronary artery disease, where a TMT is not positive, but you want to rule out coronary artery disease, CT and coronary angiogram <clears throat> investigation there. And also in post-bypass patients where you want to depict the anatomy of the graphs, 
again ct coronary angiogram is a good investigation ct virtual bronchoscopy this is again another extension of this because the software is so good because it is volume reconstruction you are able to reconstruct the bronchus in a virtual manner and not only that you can navigate yourself through the trachea through the bronchus into its divisions especially of help when the patient has a tracheal stricture or an obstructing lesion in the bronchus where the bronchoscope is would not be able to go through that but the ct bronchoscopy would be able to do that so that is a pictorial representation you can see the bronchus the trachea and the bronchus in various manners ct colonoscopy where colonoscopy actual invasive colonoscopy is not feasible or you want to do it as a screening study provided the radiation dose can be kept to a minimum you can screen the entire colon you can see that is a polyp there which is represented in both ct as well as in the 3d image now this is a case of colonic diverticulosis you can see the the diverticuli which are depicted very well which is involving the entire colon starting from sigmoid colon there and this is another case of carcinomatous growth there with stricture now ct virtual autopsy this is coming in a big way where instead of su submitting the bodies in, in post mortem state to uh, difficult uh, incisions and the man handling of the various organs instead of that you can go for a a, a virtual autopsy using the present day multi slice ct where you can peel off layer by layer and have a look at the internal organs and decide on which to sample and which not to sample and further extension of this is 3d ct simulation whenever there is a tumor the surgeon wants to go in so he can have a similar picture to either laparoscopy or open surgery you can reconstruct the tumor and you can actually remove the tumor the surgeon can practice the sort of incision and he can have an idea about what he is going to leave behind so these are all the general application and now ct is now being combined with pet so what is known as pet ct now this gives better spatial resolution and anatomical localization because pet will show you the activity which is non normal and ct will be able to localize this activity anatomically now coming to ct chest in general we know that uh, ct chest has got all sorts of advantages i am not going through that and the indications anything where you require further understanding of the pathological process something you have seen on chest radiograph you want to know what it is further you are suspecting a malignancy you are suspecting tuberculosis where you want to know mediastinal involvement on chest x ray you are suspecting a mediastinal tumor you want to further characterize it a patient comes with hemoptysis you want to look at most of the times chest x ray may not be of help a patient comes with copd with exacerbation you want to know what is happening to the lungs so all these anything to do with all these chest symptoms you want further clarification further expansion of what is happening within the lung you require ct so all sorts of indications in chest the ct is the answer now this is because as i said earlier ct gives good anatomical depiction especially after giving contrast you can see the mediastinal structures the mediastinal vessels which are shown very clearly in this this is a soft tissue window after giving contrast so that is why the lung details are not seen so that's again in and that too you can depict this anatomy in not only in axial planes but also in coronal and sagittal planes of much help now this is lung window where exquisite details of lung parenchyma can be shown again in coronal and sagittal sections now as far as ct chest is concerned we have high resolution ct contrast ct we have already talked about and sometimes we do expiratory and prone ct studies especially in certain interstitial lung diseases now just a few words about high resolution ct in earlier days of conventional ct we used to ask for high resolution ct but in the present day with volume studies we don't do a separate high resolution ct instead we reconstruct high resolution sections from the acquired volume so a multi slice ct is done these days and we can reconstruct lung windows at 0.6 or 1 mm or 2 mm at whatever levels we want so that is high resolution ct now it is just obtained from the reconstruction which we get anyway 
contrast CT, I've already said, contrast CT is not only to look at angiograms, it is also to look at the parenchymal enhancement, especially when you are dealing with a tumor, you want to clearly depict the tumor from its surrounding structures, and you also want to look at whether there is any vascular encasement. High resolution CT, the expansion is HRCT there. What it means is the sections are very thin. We go for a high resolution algorithm. Why? Because we are looking at minute structures. We are looking at lung parenchymal details down to the secondary lobule level and the septal level. And in order to get better resolution, we go for a small field of view and a large matrix of representation. Now, HRCT is indicated not in bronchogenic carcinomas or not in consolidation, but whenever we want to look at lung parenchymal details, especially in interstitial lung disease or a case of bronchitis or a case of emphysema or diffuse parenchymal involvement as you see in tuberculosis. Now, the other indication for HRCT is in ENT, that is, whenever we want to look at temporal bone, you know that the temporal bone structures, the middle ear structures, they are all very small. Where we require details, we go for a high resolution CT of the temporal bones. Now, these are the two areas, high resolution CT of the lung, high resolution CT of the temporal bone. And especially when you want to look at lung parenchymal details, go for high resolution CT. Now, these are all pictorial representations of high, where high resolution CT helps. This is a case of interstitial lung, lung disease, what is known as UIP or pulmonary fibrosis. You can see the what is known as the honeycomb pattern there, multiple cystic areas. This is what is known as traction bronchitis because of the fibrosis, the bronchi dilate and they become tortuous. So all these things are depicted well. A case of bronchitis is suspected on chest x-ray and you can see the extensive dilated thick wall bronchi there. A case of emphysema, where you can see these semilobular emphysematous changes, where you can see multiple loosened areas without any walls within the lung parenchyma. A case of suspected tuberculosis, where you can see multiple nodules bilaterally, and you can see what is known as the tree in bud appearance. A tree and the a stem and branches without any leaves there. So that is tree in bud appearance, which tells you that we are dealing with an active tuberculosis. If there is a cavity or if there is tree but appearance in a setting of tuberculosis, we'll say that radiologically we can call this as active tuberculosis. Now, this is a coronal section of pulmonary edema where you can see diffuse ground glass density in the central part of the lung. Now, just we are going through a pandemic of COVID. Just a few words about COVID and the typical patterns which we may encounter. Uh, fortunately, um, most of us have not yet seen CT findings or chest X-ray findings of COVID, but the described pattern, the classical pattern is multifocal ground glass opacities, which are peripheral and basal in distribution, unsharp demarcation. Sometimes there is vascular thickening. And usually the atypical findings are, that is what we should know, cavitation and calcification, tree inward appearance, mass-like appearance, plural thickening, plural effusion, these are all atypical findings. Now, just to see a few examples, remember chest x-ray may not always be positive in COVID patients. Now, this is a COVID-positive patient, chest x-ray was taken, which was negative, but a CT shows ground glass density, which is peripheral and basal. Now, this is another case where there is progression. You can see initial ground glass density progressing on to consolidation there, and finally, further ground glass densities in the peripheral areas. And sometimes chest x-rays are positive. So you can see the progression of the consolidation, peripheral consolidation into middle lobe and then gradual recovery. Now, this is the classical pattern, what is described. Peripheral ground glass densities becoming consolidation, bilateral, multifocal, and with basal predominance. You can see different examples here. Again, another case. Now, do we require to do imaging in all COVID patients? Now, the consensus which has emerged from across the world is imaging is not indicated in asymptomatic individuals. Remember, in asymptomatic individuals, imaging is not indicated either chest X-ray or CT. Also, in suspected COVID patients with mild symptoms, imaging is not indicated. But imaging is indicated when 
If it is a COVID patient with worsening respiratory status, you would like to know which are the areas of lung involved and why the patient is worsening. In that case, imaging is indicated. And most of the times, chest X-ray would be uh, sufficient. And also, a patient has got moderate to severe features of COVID, but test is negative. The initial test is negative. Even in that case, imaging is indicated because patient is having moderate to severe features. So consensus is asymptomatic individuals, imaging is not indicated. Suspected COVID patients, again with mild symptoms, imaging is not indicated. Imaging is indicated with severe, moderate to severe symptoms with worsening respiratory status in COVID positive patients or moderate to severe features of COVID irrespective of the positivity of the test. Now, finally, the other applications of CT. Remember, CT is a good tool for guided interventions. Wherever, whenever we take biopsy, especially from lung, a lung parenchymal lesion, always we rely on CT. So that is a CT-guided biopsy. Now, this is a CT-guided lumbar injection there, just next to the, in the paravertebral region, what is known as lumbar sympathectomy. This is a CT-guided microwave uh, application there. This is CT-guided drainage of collection. So all these procedures, CT is of great help in accurate guidance during interventional procedures. Just a few words on CT versus MRI. CT is a good general tool, but then we don't always do CT. There are a lot of other indications where MRI is of help. Now, which are the areas where MRI scores over CT? One is neuroparenchyma. Other than head injury, if you want to know infarct, if you want to know tumor, if you want to know demyelination, either involving brain or the spinal cord or various disc diseases, you require MRI. When you want to know bone marrow, especially a bone marrow edema or bone marrow infiltration, very clearly you will require MRI. Joint and cartilage imaging, everyone knows whether, whenever you want to look at the intra-articular elements of a joint, whether we want to look at the ligaments and the tendons, and you want to look at cartilage destruction, you require MRI. Head and neck tumors, for better depiction of anatomy, you require, and differentiation between soft tissues, you require MRI. Pelvic tumors, whether it's gynecological or urological, or tumors like rectal tumors, these days you require MRI. Myocardial imaging, where you want to depict uh, myocardial viability, you require MRI. Breast imaging, there is what is known as MR MAMO, which can show multicentricity of, multicentricity of lesions, especially when breast conservative surgery is planned, or other conditions of breast where you want to rule out or to do screening in high-risk patients. Finally, liver imaging, which is emerging in a big way. Though CT is helpful, there are indications where MR scores over CT. So finally, MR, the, the, the important advantage of MRI is better or the best soft tissue resolution. You can do angiographic studies without giving contrast. And most of the times when you are not able to solve problems in CT or ultrasound, MR acts as a problem solving tool. So the take home message is, as of now, CT is a one stop imaging tool because it is very fast and it is readily available. And we all know the CT appearances of most of the pathological conditions. But remember, it is not a standalone modality as in radiology. There is nothing like a standalone modality. It is always complementary to each other. So a patient for CT comes either after an ultrasound or a patient comes after a plain chest radiograph or a patient comes maybe after doing some other uh, investigation, lab investigation where CT has to confirm or rule out lesions. And remember CT with the advancement in technology, the applications are expanding as you see in CT autopsies, virtual autopsies, CT virtual laparoscopy, and so on. And the risk of CT is there are two. One is you should be concerned about radiation. Decide on the appropriateness and the risk versus benefit ratio for each indication you are asking for. And be also aware about the contrast, which can 